Thank you for your interest in the Georgia Game Developers Association's Patreon campaign. The Georgia Game Developers Association is a nonprofit that focuses on educating both game developers and fans on what is involved in making great games. For years, we have put on live events to do just that, attracting some of the greatest thinkers in game development to share their secrets. Recently, we began our live streaming channel on Mixer to expand our ability to reach those developers and gamers far beyond our state. We have seen some initial success, but we are also hearing a lot of requests for more. More workshops, more in-depth interviews, more first looks at indie games, more giveaways, and more great streams. Your support will allow us to do just that. Even at starting levels, we both recognize your support and seek your input on what to stream. At higher levels, you can actually help shape our content, gaining priority access to our speakers, the chance to share announcements, and, at the highest level, running ads and promotions for all our viewers to see. So join now to get the inside scoop on game development and to help shape one of the best game dev channels on the net. everybody hey hey and welcome to our september ggda meeting thanks for the applause while i cover up my coughing <coughs> uh, as you know we are live streaming so thank you very much for uh being an interactive part of tonight and uh thank you to kennesaw state university for hosting us here at the marietta campus how many people are from ksu Excellent. Yay. All right. How many of you took part in the game jam this weekend? Beautiful. How many of you have games that you want to get to market out of the game jam? Oh, period. All right. <laughs> Excellent. So all the more reason to hear Lee Moore and talk about funding for game studio. Show me the money. But before we do that, I want to make a few announcements and introduce a few people. Uh, first of all, we will be having Siege October 4th to 8th. Who's going to Siege? Yay. 100% attendance even though your hand wasn't up. 100% tenants. Uh, looking forward to having you all out there. As you know, uh, how many of you ever watch Extra Credits? That's so oh, beautiful. James Portnow from Extra Credits will be one of our keynote speakers. And we're going to have a lot of other fun people, including some folks in this room, talking at Siege uh, this year. Always a great event. We'll have workshops starting on October 4th, our investment conference, of course, October 5th. So listen to this very quickly and be ready for the investment conference. 
and uh, then the main conference itself, eSports Day, and more. Uh, in addition, uh, I've been asked by Xfinity to announce that they're doing a free Call of Duty event at their Xfinity store uh, near the Brave Stadium. So that information is up on our website as well. So feel free to check that out if you are interested. And I would like to point out some of our Siege uh, leads who are here. Uh, Jesse Jacobson, one of our programming track and portfolio show leads. So all of you students, get your portfolios in order so that you can get feedback, not from him, but from the good people at the portfolio review. Yeah. Uh, Wes Wilson, who's one of our speaker liaisons. Um, <coughs> Sorry, I know Daniel Kajerski is somewhere outside right now. Uh, so, uh, and a number of our excellent uh, volunteers. I do want to also point out, Zane, with the IGDA, they're putting on the IGDA Game Studio Smackdown. We have a number of game studios here today, I am seeing. Uh, so, uh, I would strongly recommend putting together those teams and competing. So, talk to Zane, and he will direct you to whoever he's going to direct you to to uh, take care of that. Uh, and... Uh, let's see. With that, I think those are my main announcements. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Lee Moore, who's been a great speaker at Siege for a number of years now for more entertainment law, and I'll let her tell you about an event she's doing. And then, uh, and, and her clicker. Yay, clicker! <laughs> so, Matt, if you want to hit record when Lee takes the mic, and we'll do that one. So, one more time, Lee Morin. Can you get, is this working? Is this working? Perfect, okay. All right, so thank you so much for coming out to the meeting tonight. It's a pleasure to be here and to meet with all of you. Um, are any of you pitching at the Siege Investor Conference? Anyone in the room? Not, not this year, maybe next year? Okay, okay, great. So this is definitely information that will be helpful in helping you prepare for an experience like that, or if you don't want to wait for Siege, for, for any type of pitch that you might make. But real briefly, um, the event that Andrew was referencing is on October 13th. Um, I will be teaching uh, one of the four sessions that Georgia State University College of Law is presenting to the creative fields more generally, including film, music, uh, graphic design, um, basically any creative professions, um, which uh, typically has freelancers um, or small businesses um, as its participants. What we're trying to do is make legal education accessible to non-lawyers, um, but we're not teaching you to be lawyers. Of course, that's, that's our personal torture. Um, but we are trying to help paint broad brush strokes, um, and that's actually a great segue into uh, my, my presentation. But um, the information I want to say was in a newsletter that may have circulated, um, and it, it's definitely on the Twitter um, wall if you want all the details of that event. Student prices are $20. It's a, it's a real steal. Um, there's a lunch keynote. Um, we have a kind of a high-profile panel um, of speakers, um, of masters in their own affairs for music. We have Ludacris coming to talk. He's also a GSU grad. Um, in film, we have Tom Blues, the executive director of The Walking Dead. He's also a GSU grad, double grad, just like me. Um, <clears throat> we have Todd Harris, of course, all of you know him, the founder of, of High Res Studios. Um, and we also have Frank Skeen, who's from B103, representing media. And uh, we have um, Rich McKay, the president of the Atlanta Falcon. They're all going to talk about their entrepreneurial journeys and the legal um, um, knowledge that they acquired along the way and developed their brand. So we hope that's a useful panel. The discussion will be moderated by Mo Ivory, who's the director of the Entertainment, Sports, and Media Law Initiative at Georgia State University College of Law, which is brand new um, this year, um, hopefully here to stay. So um, with that, let's jump into the presentation. Um, All right, so, so this is just a splash page. Um, I guess Chris and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a, have to have a lot of eye contact here. So when I point, you don't have to. So go ahead and uh, uh, welcome to show me the many how to legally capitalize your project uh, for the Georgia Game Development Team Foundation. Um, I'll give you about 30 seconds on the slide, but I'll read it with you. The information shared in show me the many how to legally capitalize your projects. 
is not legal advice, nor does its presentation to you form an attorney-client relationship between me and you. Any information you share with me today is not protected by attorney-client privilege and will not be treated as confidential. You agree that you have read this legal disclaimer and that by remaining seated, you understand to its terms. Just a little formality, guys. Um, right. So why are you here? Like I was saying earlier, I'm not here to teach you to become lawyers. You really don't want that. Um, no one wants to study hours of case law, uh, statutes, regulations, and legal theory. Um, really, here I'm here to teach you how to survive in your daily routine, right? How to understand broad concepts and principles. You'll be surprised how many you probably already know. So most people kind of their eyes glaze over, including me, when I was first figuring out what is entertainment. Um, so I love this question because every entertainment lawyer will answer it differently. But uh, entertainment is a business. It's a business that's usually built on other people's money. Anytime money is involved, guess what else comes with it? Math. Lots and lots of math. Um, I'm lucky that I like math. You know, uh, a lot of lawyers I know would run and, and tear their hair out. Um, but I also learned not only does it involve a lot of really important math to build businesses, it involves, um, I also learned that waterfalls, like the beautiful one pictured here, are not just geographical formations. Uh, they are, in fact, really important sometimes to determining how you get paid, and more importantly, how your investors get paid, if you have investors. Um, so these are just um, a couple icebreakers to kind of acquaint you with some of the um, scarier things that I have encountered, but entertainment law um, genuinely is a business, so it should be treated as such. Because what, you're, what I'm essentially doing, my job as an entertainment lawyer, is to make deals on your behalf. You know, discuss all the aspects of dealing with you, whether they be with investors, uh, lenders, um, any type of contract type of deals, transactional deals. And hopefully, someone gets paid. And who's making the money? Well, I really hope you're making money. That's the idea. Right? You're not in this business not to make money, right? Everyone wants to make some money, yes. Um, you'll be surprised in the indie world. Um, who, who knows Kevin Smith, the filmmaker? Okay, his first film he funded entirely off credit cards. And that was before the recession in 2008 when limits were much more generous. Um, but, you know, that's not really the typical fashion of doing things these days. But a lot of the time, that is one way uh, in the uh, entrepreneurs finance their operation. Um, who else is making money? Banks, lenders, in the forms of loans, typically. Funds, funds that are set up. You hear about film funds. Well, there's a creative industry loan fund that's recently been set up by Invest Atlanta, and we'll, and we'll get to that. Um, and usually those are debt transaction funds. Um, investors, we hope, are making money. Um, happy investors are good thing. Um, brokers and finders may be making some money if they introduce you um, and help close some deal um, investment uh, contracts. Partners, if you have any other friends that you're doing business with, your partners are hopefully also making money along with you. And at the end of the day, if you have any interest holders or shareholders, um, people who have an interest in your company, equity holders, Hopefully, they're also making money. So the point of this slide is to show you how many people are involved in these deals and how many people are expecting, hopefully, to make money off of one deal. One deal can have both debt and equity. Um, it's just there's no one way to skin a cat. You can skin it hundreds and thousands of ways. Um, that's why I, <laughs> I uh, sorry for the example. Um, I'm a cat owner. Um, but uh, it's just... Uh, to hammer home the concept that just don't go out on the internet and think that one contract is going to serve another deal because that's 99.9999% of the time not the case. So here we have a slide that talks about the distinction of goals and objectives. What I want to know from you guys, and don't be afraid to raise your hand, um, is what is the relationship between the two? What ties them together? Anybody tell me? Say that loud. 
Objectives fulfill goals. That is correct. And I wish I brought something to give you like a, like a cookie, you know, but um, you'll have to deal with recognition. Thank you so much. Um, next slide. Correct. A series of small objectives leads to a single goal. So we're going to talk about finance goals. Here, um, I use $250,000 because that's actually a pretty average number for um, operating expenses for a year for a typical indie project. Um, and, and not for a film, but for a production company, very possible. Okay, for a design studio, it's possible. For labor, for labor, right? It's, it's, a, it's a labor amount. So I'm suggesting, and, and that's a good point, um, but, you know, 250000 in my example would be inclusive of labor and other things like office, rent, equipment, inventory, just whatever your basic, whatever your project is, because, again, there's no one project that is alike. They're all special and unique and all have special costs. But usually $250,000 is a good place to begin. Here, I used an example of a musician because it was just um, really easy to illustrate a point. Um, so here we have a performer, a live performer. And $10,000 is actually a pretty um, healthy income to make for a, one performance. If you're, and 250 shows is actually pretty much a touring schedule for one year. All right, see, this is why I need a calculator. Um, so, but the broad concept is, so Joe, since you're the mathematician in the room. All right, so 25 shows. Oh, that's, that's so easy to do 25 shows in a year. But, you know, let's say, let's, let's, let's bring the price down then. If it was $1,000 per show, then you'd have to do 250 shows. To get to the $10,000 level, though, takes some some significant time and investment into uh, marketing and promotion. Um, the artist that I was actually thinking of when I drew this example has been working with one of the um, biggest management teams um, in the United States in hip hop um, for several years before he reached the $10,000 mark. So it takes. So the only reason this example is out here, um, honestly, is to illustrate the concept of becoming your own investor, right? I always advocate to people, before you look for money in other places, look under your own pillow for the money. You know, see if you can find the money in your own way, either through savings, and I'll give some other examples, or if you have a great viable business. Here we have a live performer who's out there hustling and he's doing really well. And he says, hey, you know what? Um, I'm going to start a record label. I'm gonna take all of the goodwill all the, the brand recognition I've built with my name. Do you want me to, oh, are you getting the clicker? Oh, you don't, I don't need the clicker, it's okay. I'm just, yeah, Chris is awesome. Chris is doing great. Thank you anyway, though. Um, so, any, uh, so back to the example. Uh, this is an example of a person trying to become their own investor, right? And they're taking a successful business enterprise and they're saying, hey, I want to do something else. Now, he might be using this as an exit strategy. He might say, as soon as I make that 250 grand, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit being a performer and I'm going to start coaching other people. I'm going to coach them to be performers. I'm going to use, you know, I'm, I'm, maybe I want to start a family and I don't want to be on the road every, you know, all year long. And, and I just want to make passive you know, and, or something like that, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons you might want to change gears. But the bottom line is, he's looking for a way to become his own investor. Next. Another way of becoming your own investor, if you don't have a successful enterprise ongoing that you can tap into or savings, um, is a lot of folks are working cushy jobs, cushy corporate jobs, right? And uh, they might not feel like it's really tapping into their creative potential, heck, they're making a killing on it, right? And they're thinking, okay, how much longer do I need to do this until I can cash out my options, my 401k, and turn in my resignation letter and do what I really want to do? That is an exit strategy. Again, you know, looking at how much, how long do I have to work? How much do I have to save so I can move on to the next thing? So I always advocate to please seed your own company if you can. There's a lot of great reasons. You're in control. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a great confidence booster, too, to be, to be the boss, to be the owner, 
right? Um, it also teaches you discipline, which is absolutely essential if you're going to survive as a business owner. Um, so this is where the discipline comes in handy. And this is where a lot of people fall short and why a lot of people don't succeed as an entrepreneur. Um, financial management. Who's ever had to create a budget? Right? Am I right? It's hard. I mean, when I became a full-time student after working in the workforce for 10 years, I could barely believe I was calculating the time. And it was terrifying because it was all loans. It was money I actually had to pay back. So uh, I had to be really accurate in what I was asking for because whatever I was borrowing, I had to return with 8.75% 8 8 premium, right? That's insane interest. And um, so financial management is crucial if you're going to start appreciating the value of money because when you start meeting with investors, Guess what? They are investors. They are they are where they are because they have appreciated the value of money. So starting with yourself is a really great, healthy way to to begin this journey. So it's really easy. It's money in, money out, basically. So you know, if this is just some examples of how that works. You might have salary or wages, um, side hustles, investments that you're earning um, for whatever reason. Um, then obviously money out, bills, living expenses, and honestly, a lot of people skip this step. But you've got to set a little bit of money aside to make money, okay? Because all work and no play makes Jack, uh, what is the quote from The Shining? Makes Jack a very dull boy indeed. Um, but it can drive you nuts. So cut the fat, build a budget, and stick to it. And then as you're doing this with your, with your, with your project, build a business plan. This is a super healthy exercise for you. And ultimately, it's one you will will need this knowledge when you're talking about your project with others, other interested parties, because investors can offer you debt or equity transactions. So you really need this type of exercise to understand your product inside and out. And since we're talking about games, um, essentially, I, I can contextualize this for you. But um, of course, the very first thing in a business, there's a lot of books out on the internet for how to build a business. I'm just going to say a lot of them that are written by non-lawyers, and they're great books. Um, so definitely go educate yourself. There, there's some wonderful literature. Um, but because of their proprietary nature, and because it's, you know, do you understand what I mean by proprietary? It's sensitive, non-public information. You're not throwing this out, basically, right? This is stuff that you work hard on. This is something unique to your to your business. And, and so this, this is a protected information. Right? You're not sharing it with the public, it's private. So, of course, the first thing, as a lawyer, I would ask is that you have some type of non-disclosure agreement right at the beginning that um, parties who are, are viewing this document must, must agree to, uh, to preserve the confidentiality of what you're going to disclose to them about um, the particulars about your project. Um, so the executive summary, of course, is last, uh, but I'll just go through this really quickly. Um, the market overview, the state of the industry, you know, just broad, broad, broad information. And a lot of the time, all the books will tell you the shorter the better on a lot of these things. The reason's beautiful, but you don't want to puff up things and you don't want to um, sacrifice detail either. Obviously, the management team, you have an advisory board. Um, the management team are your executive officers, right? So typically in a small indie company, that's um, your, uh, your, you know, your, your partners, you and your partners, if, if the owners, um, information on your company. Um, again, here is where it's important to have the goals, objectives, um, any brand identity. You know, if you're an educational or a casual uh, game company, you know, what type of brand you're, you're pushing. Um, uh, the plan of operations, how business run, revenue be captured. So, you, so you're starting to see how you really have to think through all of these things. Why, why the market needs something that you're going to deliver. You know, how many puzzle pieces are there? Joe would know, right? Um, the schedule and timetable. What is your production schedule? You know, what is the timetable for turnaround? When am I going to see a return on investment? Things like that. What's your marketing strategy? How are you going to reach your audience? Um, this is so important. The finance strategy. What are you looking, you know, how much debt are you looking to take on? How much equity are you willing to part with? You know, what money has, what skin do you have in the game? A lot of investors like to see you have some skin in the game before they put their own in because that, that shows them that you believe in what you're doing. You're willing to make the sacrifices necessary 
to execute on it. Um, financial projections can be really sticky, uh, just because they have to have huge ginormous um, disclaimers that um, you know there's no guarantee <laughs> that this is going to be the same type of lucrative project. I mean, name one game that had just like taken off, like a small indie game that just has blown up. What would what would a good example be? Okay, so 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 you know. But you take, you, like in the film industry, which is where I, where I chiefly specialize now, we take pictures like Get Out, you know, which was made for like a ridiculously small amount of money and then made hundreds of millions of dollars all of a sudden. Imagine for just like that. So whenever my clients put Get Out in their financial projections, I'm like, really? You know, really? <laughs> you got to be careful. Because um, again, we're trying to be realistic um, with, with, with whoever's reading this. Um, discuss similar ventures, similar structures, similar similar goals, similar objectives, maybe in the similar uh, genre of game that you're producing, obviously your contact, and then any exhibits. Here, um, the exhibits are, uh, typically contain abundance of property, this is for year one. Any kind of contractual agreements that you have, certainly something that might add value to your plan, and a balance sheet. Um, if you have one, if it's a, if it's a company that's already in existence that's looking to, to, to capture more funding, um, that shows uh, for the year. So, who can tell me? Let's let's read the definition for asset because equity essentially is the difference between the assets and liabilities of a company. So here we have a, a lovely definition from Wikipedia. Um, assets are tangible or intangible. I would love for you guys to name me some uh, tangible assets. Okay, one at a time. Real estate. Who else? So equipment, and that's for it. What else? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure where I put that. Um, so cash, cash is the most popular tangible asset, right? Stocks, bonds, and cash. Um, I would, I mean, yeah. Uh, so it's typically like real estate vehicles. Um, land, which is real estate, um, equipment, inventory, stocks, bonds, and cash, and then there's a few others. Um, but it's stuff that you can collateralize, right? It's stuff that a bank would take as collateral for a loan, for example. So that's why it's important to understand the difference between tangible and intangible assets. Um, what are intangible assets? What? So... Yes, in one respect, but it depends on how that is put into context, right? Probably the most popular, well-known intangible assets are intellectual property, right? So copyright, if you if you apply for or received a patent, um, have a trademark or a copyright, um, I'm sure code is, is copyright eligible, and then um, goodwill, your reputation, your trade secrets. Um, what are trade secrets? But anything from which you derive economic... Sorry to bore you with the legal definition. It's just drew in my head. Um, but anything that from which you can drive economic value that is not public information, right? Again, that's why those NDAs are so important. They protect things like customer lists, supplier lists, um, your secret sauce, basically. That's an intangible asset, right? Because at the end of the day, all of it comes together to produce value, a positive economic value, and that's an asset. Um, liability can be boiled down into one. Debt. It's debt. And debt comes in the form of loans, mortgages, accounts payable, or expenses, right? So when you're looking at equity, what's the value of your enterprise, of your, of your project that you're contemplating? You're looking to increase the equity by reducing the liability of the assets, right? That all makes sense mathematically, right? I just got to check because now I'm second guessing myself with Joe, the math. Okay. Let's talk about debt. Um, <laughs> debt has pros and it has cons. Some of the pros of debt are that it provides a finite timeline when you have to pay something back. That's when the business plan becomes super important that you have really thought things through about when you can start making those interest payments. Because interest payments sometimes can start coming, usually come due before the maturity date, which is when the principal becomes due. 
And so, you know, it's a finite time. It's not indefinite, right? So, so it's kind of like goal setting. Like I know when I have to start making these payments and then you can build benchmarks and milestones so that you know when those payments, when, when, the, when you have to raise a certain amount of revenue in order to make those payments. So uh, another pro of debt is that you own your company. You don't have an, you don't have, um, an equity holder that, shall we say, is outside of the management circle, right? Because you're the owner. You're the, I'm assuming you're the owner. You're the manager in this particular hy- hypothetical. What are the cons of debt? You have to pay back the money, right? That's kind of, kind of the idea. Um, the money is owed. Um, we're all super familiar with student loan, right? That's debt. So I have to actually pay back my law school debt. Um, although death does cancel out those payments, that, that's the silver lining, right? Um, so what, what's another con of debt? Um, if you don't pay on time, if you default, then you can lose your company. You can lose your business. You may have to declare bankruptcy. And um, even further, even scarier, is that sometimes lenders will require you to make a guarantee, uh, become a guarantor, make an individual guarantee on certain loans. Depending on your credit, depending on your history, a lot of these um, debts are obviously credit-based, um, based on if you have collateral, collateral that you can sign over. Um, but an individual guarantee means that the corporate structure doesn't protect you because what it says is, if my company can't pay you, you can come after me individually and take everything I have to. And that's what's scary about debt. Okay. And obviously, don't do deals with small companies. Um, <laughs> um, always research. Always research your investors. Always. Um, so we talked about this already. Um, two types of ways of financing. Um, your enterprises, credit card, unfortunately, is very popular. Very popular with small makers. Um, consumer loans, again, this is uh, usually smaller amounts and um, you know, you have to provide some type of proof of income. Commercial loans. Um, this is a great website from the state of Georgia. Please write it down. Um, it is a portal to all kinds of amazing finance opportunities and grants and funding that you can get through the state of Georgia. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful portal. Funds. The Creative Industries Loan Fund is currently taking applications. Um, it provides anywhere from five to $50,000 to applicants for um, very specific types of projects. Um, so that is also available to you. And finally, um, some debt investors may be private individuals. And um, the interesting thing is, as I was saying earlier, private individuals may offer you a debt deal or an equity deal, depending on how they feel about your business plan, and maybe also depending on what you're doing for your own um, financial health. And, um, but one, one area that, um, I was talking about before this presentation with the angel investor tax credit, and they do provide for a debt transaction there. Um, is it okay if I take your question at the end? Or okay, are you sure? Okay. Um, so, so as I was saying, um, the angel in- investor tax credit does apply for debt transactions, but the ma- uh, maturity date has to be at least five years. I mean, there's all these little details. Obviously, you're going to consult a lawyer before you do anything like this, right? Everybody says yes, yes. Um, I will be hammering home this concept um, before the end of this presentation. Um, but there are certain requirements that, that could trigger a recapture of that credit. Um, and you certainly want to be aware of what those circumstances are when you're, when, you're, when you're closing these deals with potential investors with the expectation that they can claim the angel investor tax credit. Um, so let's talk about equity. But I am not too old that you guys do not get this one. Does everybody know who Gordon Gecko is? Please say yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, although they did do a remake, so I guess that's sort of cheating. Um, so as I was saying earlier, equity is the difference between the value of assets and the value of liability. Context by an entity. Um, so what are the pros of equity? Um, you can raise a lot of money in a really short time. Way shorter than if you probably tried to raise it yourself, unless unless you don't, you just have a lucrative amount of money. But um, you can usually capitalize quicker. Um, also, when you connect with savvy investors, 
they come with all kinds of bells and whistles. They might have networks that they can, if, if they're emotionally attached to your project, if they're passionate about your project, which is a lot of the reason why equity investors go for projects, in addition to the fact that there's ideally a business judgment reason behind it, um, they'll bring their friends to the table. You know, they might introduce you to to other people or creative talents that, that you might not otherwise have access to because these guys travel in a certain circle, right? And so that's kind of the pros. Um, what are the cons? And of course, there's more pros and cons. I'm just going over a couple of quick ones. What are the cons? You have to give away a piece of your baby. You know, suddenly you're going to start cutting up that pie. And that means that there's more people eating at your table. And it's not just you and your friends and your past partners. Um, there's others involved. Another con, what if it's Gordon Gecko? What if it's like some 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 investor who has his or her own ideas for how your company should work, and because they're the ones holding the purse strings, they're the ones making the decisions. Well, fortunately, there is a business model that avoids that problem from happening, and we will get to it. But um, but in other instances, you know, depending on the type of investor, um, some investors, some some investors get to you have pre-existing relationships with, and you kind of know who they are. But others, you don't. You don't know who they are. You, you kind of find out as you go through something, and that can be really nasty surprises. And in the worst case scenario, it could be a bad actor. Bad actor. Um, but a lot of people have friends and family invest, you know, maybe provide that little bit of startup capital you need to pay your lawyer to get things moving um, forward. Um, and uh, w what's really cool about friends and family is that um, you know them hopefully, right? You, you have a pretty good relationship with your family and your friends, you know? Um, obviously, they know you. They might be willing to forgive a little bit of debt. Hey, guess what? They can even get a, a the, um, they can do a, a gift. I think the limit is $14,000 per, per child um, in this tax year, um, which will reduce their tax burden. So that's kind of a bonus. Um, but what are the cons of borrowing money from family. Well, things can get really awkward at Christmas if you lose their money. <laughs> okay. I have, I, huh? Yeah, yeah. Things can get really awkward at things, basically every holiday for the rest of your life. Um, and uh, what's a, another con is that depending on who your family members are, you probably are, are not going to get to capitalize that 250 k as quickly as you'd like to especially with that $14,000 limit on the gift, um, uh, on the gift perk, the tax perk. But, um, you know, um, every family's different. I'm not saying it's all the same, but this is a Cyrus and family of Christmas. Um, so let's talk about the types of equity investors, because that's really what we're moving towards here. Um, the first thing is passive versus active investors. Um, we're going to talk about active investors first because it's such an easy thing to illustrate. You and your buddies go into this one together. Each of you has a little nest egg that you've socked away, and you've all decided to come together and form a, part, a general partnership. Um, and all of you are going to participate in the active management of the company. Each of you is an investor. This is an active investment. This is not the sale of a security. So no worries there, all right? You guys uh, form a company. You have a formation documentation. We'll get to that. Um, but that is an active role. You're playing an active role in creating the profit and revenue of the company, and you've put your own money in. That's an active investment. Passive investment is what I'm chiefly concerned with um, because um, and I almost want to skip ahead to the next slide and come back for a second, but... I guess I'll just like, uh, go ahead and type and come back for a second. But this is a great passive investment is when there is a security on the table. And this is so important. I swear this is the only case I'm going to reference in this whole presentation. Um, this is the Supreme Court case decided in 1946 that actually still holds today. It um, basically is a beautiful definition of uh, what a security is. Um, and really, uh, we have security regulations set by the Securities and Exchange Commission to protect consumers, right, to protect um, potential investors. And, you know, you have public offerings. I'm focusing in the private, sp uh, private sphere. So private companies, closely held companies, that's what you guys are. Um, you're not making public 
offering, you know, selling to the public or anything, because those are held under much stricter scrutiny. The private private companies are um, exempt from registration. They don't have to register, but but it comes with some certain requirements. So a security essentially is a situation where um, someone um, is investing money into your enterprise and they do not have an active role um, or participate in the management and creating that revenue, creating that return. They're actually depending on you. So you're making a promise to them. You're saying, if you, if you loan me some money, um, then, and you lead them to the expectation that there may be some profits um, based on your hard work, that is the sale of a security. Do you see how easy it is to sell a security without knowing? And how scary that I, I freak out every time people start saying, oh, you know, we're going to go get some investors. Oh, really? <laughs> um, as soon as this idea creeps into your mind, you talk to an attorney who is specialized in corporate finance and in securities in particular, in private securities. Um, so let's go back to the other slide real quick. So we just talked about passive investors. There's some types of passive investors that you should be aware of um, because um, obviously, uh, there's two very distinct kinds. Everybody's heard of accredited investors. They're the sophisticated business savvy investor. Um, that's the assumption anyway. Um, their net worth is over a million dollars, not including their front of home. Um, and their annual income is at least $200,000 for the last two years and the current year, or $300,000 if they're married. Um, everybody else is unaccredited, pretty much. I mean, that's just the quick and dirty definition. Um, and so bad actors can apply either in the investor scenario or in the issuer. Now, as a business owner, you would be the issuer. You're issuing securities, right? So if you're out there selling securities without following the proper rules and regulations, you could be convicted of a misdemeanor or a felony. And it happens all the time in California with filmmakers. It's really sad. Um, and then you become a bad actor and you're prohibited from raising money for a long time. You can even go to jail. And so it's really, really serious. And so that is why it's so important to please consult an attorney if you're considering using a, an equity type of transaction in your financial strategy of your business plan, right? So let's go to the next slide. Uh, we talked about, no, we're, we're good. We talked about the, what is the security. Does anybody have any questions on what is the security? Because this is a really important concept. Is that confusing? Is it clear? Okay, cool. Stop me. I mean, that, I mean let me know. Um, so <laughs> this is the really fun stuff, the, um, the exempt securities. Um, this is what you pay me to understand. <laughs> I'm just going to say it because, um, yeah, it's, it's intense. It's really intense. Uh, but remember when I said that private securities are regulated, they, they're exempt from registration. Well, you still have to follow some rules, right? Um, so we're really going to focus on regulation D. But I'll quickly talk, and the reason I put the dollar amounts up there is because I kind of wanted to get give you an idea of the scope of the raises we're talking about, right? So if you're an indie studio, the likely, oh, and what you see here, right, you see is a public offering that's exempt from registration. So it's it's special, it's super special. But to give you an idea of the scope, an indie game studio is not going to be seeking to raise, you know, 50 million, 20 million, you know, out the gate, typically, unless you know, if you're Bill Gates, then you want to have an indie studio, like SGI, I don't know, just like all these bells and whistles. But typically what the indie world goes for is regulation D. Um, remember that pie example I gave you about how many people are eating at your table? Because we have something now called regulation, um, crowd, equity crowdfunding. How many of you have heard of equity crowdfunding? It's different from the old crowdfunding model. Um, can you tell me what distinguishes, what it, what, the old crowdfunding model basically is not equity because you're getting something, right? You're getting like a perk or something for your $25, maybe a t-shirt or a mug or something like that. Um, so you're actually paying for that when you crowdfund, right? That's what the various perks are about. Equity crowdfunding is different, highly regulated, um, only through certain platforms. Um, and you can you, the limits are less than a million. So obviously that fits our $250,000 model, right? Our annual revenue model. But the amounts of money that have to be, um, or that are the minimum amounts of raise that are typical of a crowdfunding model are, are very, very small compared to what you would see under Regulation D. And what that basically translates to is 
lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of mouths eating at your table. It can get mad how many people uh, might participate in an equity crowdfunding platform. Um, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying, um, you know, definitely consult an attorney and learn about all the pros and cons of that particular type of crowdfunding. I love crowdfunding, but I don't like equity crowdfunding. I think regular old-fashioned crowdfunding is awesome if you're looking to raise maybe up to 50 grand. Um, that's, that's, that's a nice, healthy, robust number um, that I've seen done on several occasions. And, um, and it, can, it can provide development funding. It can provide uh, maybe uh, just a little boost, maybe pay for some legal expenses. You know, it's, it's, it, and it also is great marketing, right? You get to interact with your audience. You get to learn about your product a little bit more. Um, so I'm not dissing at all crowdfunding, just equity crowdfunding. If you have an option between that and Regulation D, I would recommend going into Regulation D. Regulation D is the most popular um, type of exempt securities. Um, Rule 504 is just up there because it's still valid law, but most people don't use it because it does not preempt, it, it has no federal preemption, and that's a legal term I know, but, um, Securities law is both federal and state level. Um, the Secretary of State of Georgia um, is the administrative agency that has the securities division, and that's where you find a lot of the regulations. Um, but Rule 504 means not only do you have to adhere to federal laws, but you have to adhere to state laws. And with 50 states and investors potentially in many states, you can understand how complicated and complex that can be um, when you're assembling an offering. Um, that has to be compliant with laws in multiple places. So most people say, forget that, and move on to 506B or C. Those are the most popular forms um, that I have used. 506B is special because it, it allows you to combine both accredited and unaccredited investors, but only up to a certain number. And I promise I'm not going to lose you in details because, again, that's what you pay to get into the game, right? Um, so, but what's, what's special about 506B is um, it's an unlimited amount of money that you can raise. So there's no specific requirements, and it can combine both accredited and unaccredited investors. Um, Rule 506C, on the other hand, is only accredited investors. Another thing that distinguishes them is, um, do you guys know what general solicitation is? Do you know what solicitation is? Right, but general solicitation is just selling to anyone, right? You don't have to have a pre-existing relationship. This is when finders and brokers picture because they're hey I'll make I'll, I'll introduce you to somebody and I'll make some money from that introduction and I might even close that deal to make the commission now we're going to get to the difference between finders and brokers that's another big problem that I see a lot happening all the time it scares me so much but um because they can be bad actors too um but uh general solicitation is allowed in 506c it is prohibited in 506 you have to have a pre-existing relationship with um, the, uh, obviously, because we're talking about unaccredited investors. So we have to have a pre And again, these rules are drawn to protect investors, right? But also to protect you and the investments that you're closing. Because if you don't follow these rules, investors can get their money back, or they can sue you if you've already spent the money. You know, there's, there's a lot of um, remedies that they have available to them if you don't follow the law. Um, so those are the main distinctions, I think, between B and C I want to touch on. Let's go to the next slide. So we've already talked a little bit about the pie and how many um, how many mouths are eating at your table, but this is a very real real concept I want to hammer home to all of you. Um, it's a very long definition, but the most important part is this. <laughs> Remember we talked about building, um, increasing the equity, the value in your company, because remember, entertainment is a business, and want to make money <laughs> so and 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 so dilution is a very real situation that you come into when you start um selling securities or issuing securities in your case um because you're having to consider where do i want to carve that um piece of my baby out do i want to um cut a premium uh share and, uh, or do I want to cut out an ownership share? You know, it, there's all these questions that you really have to go through with an attorney um, because a lot of it depends on which structure you choose. Um, so again, there's no one easy answer I can give you and that's the frustrating part, right? But dilution is just something that you need to be aware of when you're trying to 
considering doing an equity deal um, because it can reduce the, the, the value of um, your partner, right, ultimately, because that's a um, So let's talk about finders and brokers. Who's ever heard of a finder broker? Okay, I see two hands. Really? Y'all have never heard of, well, we all know stock brokers. Just for some, right? Um, so finders and brokers, so, so, oh, it's already over there. I was going to ask you a question. Good, good. So here are the main differences. Finders are not regulated. Um, they can be an ordinary person. You don't have to be registered. Um, you just need to know people who have money. That's really it. Trust. Brokers are highly regulated. You can do a broker check on FINRA on their website. That's a great place to go um, research somebody. If they call themselves a hotshot, you go check out their record. It's public information. Um, and then finders typically collect a flat fee, regardless of whether or not you actually get some money out of it, out of the person that they introduce you to. They collect a flat fee. That's extremely important. Uh, brokers, on the other hand, collect a commission. What is a commission? Can define that for me. Come on. Percentage. Anytime you see, I'm going to make 5% off of anything you get, that is a broker deal. It's not conclusive, but it is certainly the red flag that raises that. So I have seen finder agreement after finder agreement <laughs> from my own clients. It scares me. Um, clients will draft their own documents, by the way, all the time and not tell me. And I find out later a lot of fun. Um, but I see finder agreements with percentages for the pay. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That is a commission. It is a transaction-based um, payment because it depends on the success of the deal. And the reason that's dangerous, the reason the SEC wants to uh, make sure those people are regulated is because closing a transaction for a broker incentivizes them to make the pay, right? Whereas the finder, they don't care if you make money or not because they get paid anyway. Right? All they have to do is introduce you to somebody. So it's great to be a finder. Great to be a finder. Great to know money, people with money. So those are the, so, so essentially the services too, right? Making introductions, maybe handling a little paperwork. Certainly they're not going to the level of brokers. Actively participating in the deal making, the selling, and the closing. Okay, those are, those, are, those are a lot of services, and that's why they're so highly regulated. And again, brokers have to register. Finders don't. So I guess the bottom line... <laughs> is please ask a lawyer before you take action and 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 setting up your company and and, and considering you know when when basically when you have started making that plan that is a good time to go to a lawyer and say hey this is what i'm kind of thinking what do you think i review business plans a lot in fact i draft sometimes help help clients um with the drafting part but obviously i gotta write the disclosures right um and the ndas but uh you know Right around the time you're starting to build that business plan, it's a good time to consult with an attorney and say, um, am I doing this right? Is my, is my financial strategy sound? Um, do, I, do I need documentation? Um, you know, I've been asked to work as a finder. A lot of the time, if there's a project that has already got an attorney attached, then I might know some. I work with investors a lot. I work with a lot of investors. I work with tax attorneys who have clients who are wealthy families. And so I do. I can perform services as a finder. Um, so a lot of the time, your attorney is going to be your best friend in so many ways. Plus, you have that great thing called privilege. And so everything is confidential. So, it, you know, feel free to speak freely with your lawyer about your concerns and your worries um, over your project as early as you can. So let's talk about structuring, because the reason I saved this for last is because, to me, structuring your enterprise depends on how you're going to capitalize it, the nature of your project, how many people are involved, um, you know, uh, do you have business acumen, or do you need some advisors who are going to provide that extra acumen for you, because what if there's nobody on your team who has proven success at actually building and delivering a game. Is somebody going to want to invest in that? Maybe not, but if you have that person attached to your plan, chances are maybe better because they'll be like, okay, he's actually working with somebody who's done this before. It's not their first rodeo, right? So entities to me come last. Um, now, this is just a basic piece of, of this is not. If you're 
it's just you guys are not going to be in a partnership if you're like a, a Jim Carrey and a, with multiple personalities. Um, so, uh, so you alone, you can you have some options. Sole proprietorship is actually the most popular business formation in Georgia. Um, believe it or not, um, there are registration requirements to that, uh, like what most people believe. Um, just not with the Secretary of State. It's usually with the county clerk of uh, your um, clerk of superior court of your county of residence. Um, also, you can be a single member LLC. You can also be a corporation. If it's you plus one or more, you might have a general partnership. Again, um, you would not register a general partnership with the state, but what you probably file is a doing business as or a trade name application, again, with the clerk of uh, superior court for the county of uh, the residence of the business. I should say, their principal office. Um, you can also have a multi-member li limited liability company, and you can also have a corporation. So limited partnerships get their own side because they're super. Also, they are investment vehicles. Remember when I said that um, choosing, uh, you know, choose your investors wisely because um, especially in a, in a situation, it depends, again, on, on who's investing in your project. Um, but say you're soliciting, making a general solicitation um, with people you don't know, um, one way to protect the management um, part and make sure that you have full creative control over your enterprise is to form a limited partnership. And what that is, legally speaking, is one general partner and one or more limited partners. Um, limited partners, everybody's heard of the term silent partner, right? Well, they're silent for a reason, because they're protected. They have a liability shield so long as they are they are from the management of the company. They cannot make any any management um, acts. Uh, the, you know, the general partner, which is be you, um, manages the day-to-day -day operations. You assume the entire risk of the entity, um, but your limited partners do not. All they have is um, an expectation of, you know, making, making their return on investment, and that's it. That's what's so beautiful about a limited partnership. Most people get scared and say, well, I don't want personal liability as a general partner, but then become an LLC or a corporation, and then use and enjoy that liability protection as a general partner. So there are ways of creating that. And what I see a lot is with production companies, they will form an LLC or a corporation. Again, I'm going over a lot of details, so I'm sorry if I'm jumping around if any of this is unclear, um, but there's reasons we'll get to why either of those. Um, they will form one of these um, entities with liability protections, and uh, then they will form a limited partnership for their particular business venture for enterprise or project um, film or limited partnership you know LLCs a lot of people think LLCs are the way to go but I'll tell you what um, LLCs by their nature have managers which would be you right the person running the day-to-day -day. Um, as a manager you're also a member you have two members now um, you can hire a manager who's not a member this is where it gets kind of confusing sorry um, and they can be like the sales officer that, that runs the day to day, and you can stay a member. But then you have investors, equity investors, and guess what? They're also members. And guess what members get to do? They get to vote. Voting is kind of steering and guiding in some ways, right? Um, usually, the way the, the things that they get to vote on are the things that you need unanimous voting on, right? Like dissolution. Do y'all know what that means? Dissolving a company, um, any kind of any kind of act which might um, substantially alter their rights to profit in the company, substan selling substantially all of the assets of the company, that kind of stuff, they get to vote it. So, and they also sometimes get to vote on who gets to be the manager. That sucks. So, uh, depending on how the operating agreement is written, that's why I always advocate for limited partnership for business ventures when you're when you're raising um, when you're doing equity deals. You know, when, when you're bringing in investors into the picture that you may or may not know. Or that you just may not want to have any management in the company. So, which one, which one? This is a, a really good question. And again, I can't stress enough. Most people say that marriage is the most stressful relationship of their life, but it's not. It's a business partnership. I mean, that's a real statistic. You can Google it. It's a business partnership is the most stressful relationship you can have. Can you believe that? Worse than marriage, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I actually I actually represent husband and wife uh, production companies. It, it does happen. Um, there are some pros and cons to that, believe it or not. Um, 
you know, um, estate drafting, for example, you know, because of a lot of the estate laws. Do y'all know what estate laws means? It's like the stuff that pat- kicks in when somebody passes away. Um, you know, you have you have little things that'll fall into place that make it. You don't have to. You have to draft le- draft less stuff. Okay, so an example would be in a multi member LLC. Obviously, it's multi member with a husband and wife and it's one. Um, Usually, if uh, one of the members passed away, um, you would have this interest that would be hanging out here, and uh, um, and it might be if it's not claimed, the company would dissolve or something. But because of the marriage, the estate laws lets it pass over to the spouse, and it maintains the integrity of the company. I know that's a really weird example, but um, actually worked with a couple like that. So just choose your partners wisely. That's the point, right? Because the management day to day is is really where the rub the, the rubber hits the road. Yeah. Um, so this pamphlet is actually available online. It's two pages. It was so big I couldn't even put it on one page. But this was written um, by the State Bar of Georgia um, for not lawyers. It is an awesome comparison chart. But again, it goes into the four main things people consider when they're thinking about which form of company should I choose. And I'll tell you the order in which most people think about that. Liability is number one, right? Everybody's like, well, I don't want to, I don't want people to come after my personal assets. First, don't sign any personal guarantees, remember? <laughs> and if you do, talk about it first, you know, talk, talk that through. Make sure you understand what that means. But most people want liability protection. In that case, the sole proprietorship and the general partnership are not for you. Um, it's actually the next one. Identify uh, the corporation or the limited liability company are going to give you that liability protection um, that you're after. The second thing most people consider out of practice is administration. Who likes paperwork? Okay, yeah, see, this is why I'm the drudge worker and you're not. Um, So ease of administration. If you're just starting out, you have so much on your mind already. I mean, who wants to be having organizational meetings and uh, making sure that, you know, you have all these, you know, documents are filled out completely and you're you're being regular with your reporting. Um, The thing with companies that offer liability protection is it comes with certain obligations. Who's heard of piercing the corporate veil? Is that a term y'all are familiar with? That happens if you're not careful and you follow all the rules, meaning that usually the way that happens the most frequently is people mix money. So they don't open a business checking account or they pay for business expenses with their personal account. Um, You have to have very distinct bank accounts if you're going to benefit from the liability protections offered by a corporation or a limited liability company. That's that's the biggest problem that I see people run into. Um, so ease of administration. Corporations are very paperwork heavy. Limited liability companies, you have one agreement, typically, typically in a startup. I mean, and you have to work with somebody to do that. Um, another thing, obviously, that um, obviously with the sole proprietorship, there's really no paperwork at all, hardly ever, except for your registration document with the county. General partnership usually has a partnership agreement. Limited partnerships, again, you have your, your partnership agreement uh, with your uh, individual um, partners. And then taxes are probably going to be actually control. I would say control is the third thing you can think about. And again, with, when you're the boss, when you're the sole proprietor, obviously you're in control. Um, with a general partnership, um, you know, that's, that's split among the partners. Typically they share in the profits and the losses of the business and the running of the business. Uh, we talked about limited partnerships already, um, and then LLC to corporation are unique. LLC, uh, typically, you can have a member that's also a manager, or you can just hire a manager outright as a member, and they can um, handle the management. But still, the members are in control of the company. Corporations, the shareholders, ultimately are in control, um, who elect a board of directors, who elect executive officers, but in the indie world, um, that's, now you kind of see why that's kind of a really um, complicated form to have if it's just you and your buddies. Um, <laughs> so uh, taxes are usually the last thing, although very important, last but not least, things that people consider. Um, and as you can see from this chart here, uh, we have in the corporate world double taxation. Um, pass-through taxation is when the uh, profits and losses are reported on your individual income tax return, and that can happen with all of the other forms. Um, with partners, you get a schedule for your share um, that would be reported on your individual income tax return. And in an LLC, it's the same. It's passed through unless you elect to be taxed as a corporation, and that's where the term S-corp comes in. Okay, that's a tax status. That's not a legal status. It's a tax status. Um, Typically, I I advise clients not to go through that direction, to be elected as an S-corp until they're making revenue of at least 
almost $100,000 a year. Um, last, next slide. And next slide. Yep. And that's it. And um, I did not bring cards, so that's my contact information. Please write it down. And don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions. Um, I think I went a whole hour, you guys. So you've been a great audience. Um, I'll take any questions. Oh, it was a it was a link. Yeah, sure. Um, what do you want to know about it? It's invest it's Invest Atlanta. Invest Atlanta. Um Andrew, can you talk a little bit about this? Invest Atlanta. I think he's actually worked with them a little bit. Um advisory board for this group and it is still in the gestational uh, phase, but uh, you have to have your office, your business in Atlanta or live in Atlanta. And then there is a loan that can be given out specifically targeting creators, <clears throat> and video games are one of the ones that they are targeting. So uh, they're still in the process of getting it up and running, but it's definitely something to follow. Check it on their website. You'll get updates about uh, when they're ready to go. This year, this year. I think they're still setting up the legal structure for it, but uh, check back in on the site. All debt transactions, by the way, they're all going to be loans. So, and they they depend on credit, of course, like a typical loan. They're going to do a credit check, um, but they are uh, apparently very adamant about working with individuals to help them get those loans. And the minimum amount is five thousand, and the maximum you can get is fifty. Your backyard. No, um, it, it's the city of Atlanta, and the city of Atlanta is very defined geography and uh, what it is. And they're annexing more parts, so you might be annexed tomorrow, so who knows? Any other questions? And I'm sorry for the people in the live stream. I'll just repeat the question before I answer it. So the question for the people on live stream is, what do I think of legal Zoom? for starting an LLC, um, don't do it. That's my bottom line. And I'm not just saying that because it's my business, you know. Um, I say it because I genuinely care about the health and welfare of my clients, and I care about them so much that I'm, I, I'm terrified for them using the form um, without interpersonal connection, you know, without a human being working with them on an individual basis. Now, if there's a lawyer on the other end of that, that is licensed to practice in the state in which you're setting up that company who can understand the state's laws that apply to your particular formation? Sure, but guess what you don't get? You don't get the industry know-how, the knowledge of your type of business, the connections that come with having an attorney who knows other people in this industry. You know, um, they can do so much more than draft documents for you. Lawyers can. And so LegalZoom is just a very impersonal, potentially dangerous direction to go. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so the question is, with an indie development company, would I recommend an LLC or a partnership? Um, so let's do some math first. How many people are, are, are going to be on your enterprise? At least two. Well, more than one. More than one. So obviously, you can't be a sole proprietor. So your options, if you're more than one, would be a partnership, LLC, or corporation, potentially. Again, that all depends on going back to the business plan, right? Have you built a business plan? He says, not yet. I'm sorry, I'm repeating for the live stream. I'm not parroting, I swear. Um, but <laughs> so, so, so go through the experience of building the business plan, of, of thinking about how this project is going to work, how, who's going to be involved, um, are, are you, you know, what's the market like, what, what else has been done that's similar to what you're doing, how, and most importantly, what your financial strategy is going to be, because once you know that, you'll have a better idea of, of what kind of entity to build, but the most popular version, I'll be honest with you, is a, par is a, is a partnership, um, but because of the liability protection that people want, they usually go in the direction of an LLC. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Yes.
Yep, so you're talking about um, non-equity funding, right? Regular crowdfunding, yeah. So uh, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, I know Seed Smart is out there as well, but I think those are just for films, motion pictures. So, uh-huh, um, I think so. I don't have a lot of personal experience working with them, but I have clients who've used them successfully. Good, so whole panel at Siege for Kickstarters, live stream. Yes. <laughs> wow. Um, actually, what's interesting about that is I'll use an example um, that one of my mentors, uh, who's known as the film securities lawyer in Texas, uses is that he typically will wait on actually registering the company until there's money on the table. You know, because if you if you register early, maybe you maybe you you know you don't know what kind of deals ultimately will be will be formed. Um, but again, it's kind of the chicken or egg scenario. You know, the investors want to see there's some structural integrity to what they're investing in, but at the same time, depending on how the deals are written, may 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 decide the direction of that structure. So um, I think in, the best thing to tell you is to consult a lawyer before you you actually you know take that decision. Yeah. And on uh, Kickstarter, also remember that if you really blow it. There are folks who will sue and come after you, and it's always better to them sue a company than an individual. That was from Andrew. All right, um, other questions that I have um, from people in the back, maybe? Yes? Right. So. Are there a lot of game studios that are nonprofits? I guess Drew Drew Crescente is a company. So Jennifer's project is right, right. Um. So the. So how many game studios are nonprofits for real? Are there? Right, that makes sense. Right, I thought I thought he was asking about nonprofit corporations. Like, like was that the was that the question? Like, how does how does so say the question one more time? Yeah, because because remember, we're we're the idea is to make money, right, for profit. It's been a while since I've worked in the nonprofit sphere, but my general understanding, they're very highly regulated, and I seriously doubt that they're allowed to sell securities. Yeah, no, those donation funded, um, they're highly regulated because they're getting their money tax free, you know? I mean, yeah, I would say that's a no. Okay, so any other questions? Um, yes? Yeah, ask Andy Lackey. He relocated from San Francisco, uh, Wabi Sabi Sound. You guys know him, right? He's been speaking at Siege before. Was that was it, so? What was the question? I'm sorry.
I can give you an example. Um, when, they, when the post-production, um, Entertainment Industry Post-Production Investment Act became law and um, would, would have been effective the first tax year it would have applied would be this year, I had calls from post houses in L.A. Um, talking about relocating to Georgia and consulting me on that. And actually, the state of Georgia, under the Commerce Wing, Commerce Department, provides a lot of free services, even including employment um, and finding employees and finding commercial buildings for people who want to relocate to our state um, and, in particular, into Opportunity Zone. Do you all know what those are, what I mean by that? Opportunity Zones are economically uh, less developed parts of Georgia that um, the job there's like a job uh, in tax credit as well that I didn't talk about because this is a startup conversation more, <laughs> you know. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really great reasons to, to locate to Georgia, sure. And if you're in a place that's uh, more advanced, like L.A. for film or Silicon Valley for um, technology, um, then, yeah, you might have started there. Um, but sure, relocating, I think the, the, the clinch with that is to do it when you have fewer employees. And if you're going, if you have more employees, then maybe keeping a satellite office and making your main office the, the state that you're directing your, your business to. And obviously, um, you'd also have to consider, remember Andrew mentioned the, um, well, actually, I, it's been so long since I've looked at that legislation, but um, you also have to consider how many hours or days you're spending between each state, right? Because I think if you're making an annual, this is where it gets technical, I'm sorry, bear with me, my brain, I've been doing two days a day in addition to this. So um, if you are earning a salary, you have to actually figure out how much of that salary was earned in Georgia and how much of that salary was earned in California. <laughs> and then that's the amount you get to claim, you know, under the um, expenditures portion if you're taking that credit. Because a lot of people like they relocate here for those awesome credits and incentives, right? So does that kind of help illustrate just a couple of the complications that you're going to face? And obviously the whole moving all the paperwork to, to, to register and figure out if you're going to keep that satellite office registering as a foreign entity here or, you know, just starting over completely. You know, a lot of, a lot of things to think about. You're welcome. Who else has a question? Do we have time for more questions, Andrew? Or we? Okay. Hey. So the question for the people on live stream is, um, this gentleman whose name, I forget, I'm sorry, Matt, I should know your name. Um, Matt asked, uh, he's heard about people incorporating in Delaware, um, um, and is there a golden rule that applies as to at what point um, you, you, reach, you, you reach that point? Why would you incorporate in Delaware? I think it's really the, the main question. Um, a lot of people ask the same question about Nevada um, because, or, you know, Wyoming, for example. I don't know if you think Wyoming. But, you know, they're, they're, they're little, you know, very, very teeny perks with registering in different, in those particular three states. But um, if you're going to, if you're in Georgia and you're registering in Delaware, you still have to register in Georgia. And it's just going to cost more money to maintain. Um, uh, and I've actually had a client who um, was a software developer and he just used LegalZoom and he incorporated in Delaware. Bless his heart. And then, um, <laughs> but he lived in Massachusetts, and um, and he was acquiring property in Wisconsin, if I remember. And I was doing like a ridiculous M and A transaction, which took three years to complete. It was very, very complex, very, very painful because we were. Uh, I can't tell you the details, unfortunately. I wish I could share my pain with you. <laughs> But I can't. So the long story short is he ended up having to pay so much franchise tax because Delaware charges a franchise tax. Um, and you have to look at what the rules of registration. Texas charges a franchise tax, a hefty one for LLCs. Um, and so a lot of people um, need to do the research. If you, if you, you know, why are you incorporating? Usually the people, reason people incorporate in Delaware is because they are the most historically thorough um, place of, of corporate law, right? We have these amazing business courts. Their business courts are super sophisticated. We also have good business courts in Atlanta, just so you know. Um, but um, that's the main reason um, that people go to Delaware. Um, 
but and I, I think unless you have any physical reason to be in that state, there's no reason for you to incorporate in Delaware. That would be my general response. But okay, that's not legal advice. That's, that's me not knowing you know the specifics of your case. But if you're in Georgia, register in Georgia because if you register in another state as a domestic entity, you're still going to have to come back and register in Georgia because there's a physical presence in Georgia. You're physically here. And so you're going to owe tax in two states and have rules in two states as opposed to one. It just, financially speaking, seems to make more sense if you have no other reason just to register in the state of your residence. Does that help answer the question? All right, long answer. Um, all right, thank you guys so much. Thank you very much, Lee. And thank you, KSU, for hosting us. Lee, you going to stick around for a little bit to take any more questions? And thanks to our clicker. You're going to stay around a little bit? Excellent. So. Uh...